This is a production of Cornell University. Tim Sweeney, who is a policy analyst and uh, works 150% for ag and markets, 100% of that on hemp and 50% on his real job. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so Tim is just going to give us a little overview of the current regulatory status uh, from the ag and markets perspective, and then I'm sure he'd be happy to take uh, all of your questions. Maybe not all. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, so I just want to start off with um, a little background on the program. As many of you probably know, the 2014 Federal Farm Bill was what was the law that allowed us to begin this whole adventure in the first place. And subsequently now the 2018 Farm Bill has expanded the program and changed it somewhat, uh, whereas uh, hemp is no longer a controlled substance federally. However, until we have guidelines from the federal government, from the USDA in particular, we are continuing to operate under the 2014 program guidelines. So you need to keep that in mind uh, that it is not yet a fully free market out there. You still need to register with the state and you will even after the 2018 program is fully enforced. That's part of, part of the requirements of the federal farm bill. Um, so the, the, the farm bill requires that the USDA now take charge of industrial hemp. It takes it out of the realm of the DEA as it's no longer a controlled substance. I should say as an aside though, New York law has not quite caught up yet, so technically hemp is still a controlled substance in New York State, but they're working on fixing that. So the USDA now is in, pro is in the process of establishing their regulations to run the hemp program for the entire nation. Once their regs come out, once their program guidelines come out, each state that wants to, hold, wants to uh, host a program will have to apply to the USDA, the USDA will have to approve the state program, and after that we will um, do rulemaking in New York State, which will then, uh, for those of you who are in the program, you're familiar with the research partner agreements, we expect that the requirements to have those will, will go away and we'll be running the program pursuant to regulations. But for now, all of those requirements for the research partner agreements remain in force and, and the, the 2014 uh, Farm Bill remains in force. One exception that any of you who wanted to get seed in the past from a foreign source know what you had to go through with us for that. We had to apply to the DEA to get an import permit. They would then send the paperwork back to me. I would send your permit to you. The seed would have to be delivered to our office in Albany, and then you'd have to come and get it. That has all gone away now as the DEA is no longer requiring and will not issue any import permits. Uh, early on this year, that there was kind of a bit of confusion where the the DEA said, we're not issuing permits, and the government in Canada said, well, we're not sending seed to the U.S. without a permit. So we were kind of in a tough spot there, but we finally worked all of that out. There are no longer any DEA permits required, and you do not have to come to Albany to pick up your seed anymore. It can be delivered directly to you, and any of you that had the misfortune of having to come to our office to get the seed will appreciate how big a deal that is. Um, so... Over the years since uh, the 2014 Farm Bill started this all off, 2016 was our first year that we had a crop in the ground in New York State, and the program has grown like crazy since then. I think we're up to just over 500 growers now, and that represents about 18,000 acres approved for growing in New York State. Um, about 75% of that, a question was asked in the morning session, how much of the, the acreage is devoted to CBD. About 75% is CBD, uh, uh, would be a, a good guess, I think. We're currently taking applications for growing for fiber, grain, and CBD. We're currently taking applications for processing of fiber and grain. We are not, however, accepting any applications right now for processing CBD. And uh, we don't know when that will open up again. I expect it will, but I really have no idea when that would be. Let me make sure I'm not missing anything here. Okay, with regard to CBD, CBD in food, according to the FDA, and the FDA still has oversight over CBD, that was pretty clear in the federal farm bill that nothing in the farm bill undid FDA law. And so as far as the FDA is concerned, you cannot add CBD to food and you cannot sell CBD as a dietary supplement. New York State, we have a different approach. You can add CBD to products that look like food 
if those products are made as a dietary supplement in a GMP facility and following all the Code of Federal Regulation sections that apply to dietary supplements. The product would then have to be labeled as a dietary supplement, marketed as a dietary supplement, and sold as a dietary supplement. So we are a little bit different than, than uh, some other states in that regard, but we do allow CBD in, in those products. Does anyone have any questions so far? I think I'm pretty much, uh, I pretty much covered everything that I needed to tell you. For now, the application process remains the same. You apply to us. It's still a $500 fee. It's a three-year application, a three-year license that you would be granted. You would go through the process of, of having to do the research partner agreement, having that notarized and returned to us. Um, you would need to still be sampled uh, 21 days prior to when you want to harvest. You contact us. We will send a horticulture inspector out. You have to fill out what's called a harvest report form with us. Our horticulture inspectors will come out. They'll sample your crop, send the sample back to our food lab to do the regulatory test, and then you'd be uh, good to go if your crop is, is within legal limits. Any thoughts on how much lead time we need to give you for harvesting? Yes, it's, it's within 21 days. No, but of your inspectors coming out and getting the harvest report. So you report. You're not call us today and get them out tomorrow. You apply to us. You send in the harvest report form, which is more like a harvest request. It's sort of a misnomer. So it's a harvest request form. So within 21 days of when you want to harvest is when you should send that form to us. So and then we will do our best to get an inspector. I think they're shooting for within a week. Yeah, two, two to three days in my experience. Okay. Two to two to three days. Larry says has been his experience. Um, what do you say to uh, stores that are selling CBD products that can be shipped anywhere nationally? That is not within the purview of, of our program. So we have um, told people that if, if they are selling a product that the FDA considers illegal, they are definitely in a, you know, they could be in a bind there. And, and it's, there's somewhat of a gray area as to what is allowed and what isn't allowed, but some of it's very plain, and the FDA, if they choose to enforce, they, they could take enforcement action. Can you tell CBD uh, the bud or use? You cannot sell any raw flour in New York State to anyone outside the program, and you cannot make any uh, smokable or vapable products in New York. What is your timeline uh, once the FDA has established guidelines, uh, FTC or whatever it needs for uh, cross-border transactions, uh, are you expecting to come out about the same time they are? Obviously, you're going to have to review, do some policy looking. So you're talking about when the USDA yeah, yeah. issues when, their when program? When do you expect to come out with state, state well, after? as the soon FDA. as possible is the answer, and I know yeah, that's not right, a great answer. Right. We are, um, I, I spoke with the woman who runs the ag marketing services section at the USDA, and they're tasked with developing the, the program, and she said that they are on track for early fall release of the USDA program guidelines. Right. So then we will uh, do everything in our power to get our program submitted to them in a timely fashion and get it back out. I would certainly hope that we would be running under the new program for next growing season, but we don't know. There's a lot of, there's a lot of variables in, in, in potential hang-ups there. Thank you. Two questions and the last question. You mentioned that there's CBD is not legal for <coughs> Can you say it again? Can you? And the last question before last, you said something that smokable CBD flour cannot be sold. Did I misheard that? No, you heard it right. Sir, can you repeat the question? Okay. The question was whether or not CBD smokable flour is allowed in New York State. It, it is not. We do not in the in our program. You cannot sell raw flour to anyone outside the program, and it cannot do any smokable or vapable products. How is it being sold in New York State? They're not in our program, or they're violating their program agreement with us, and if that's the case, then they could be expelled from the program. <laughs> right. Yeah. 
uh, I don't want to speculate on legislation that hasn't, you know, hasn't passed yet and may may actually look a lot different than the old legislation. We don't. I don't know what it would look like. Um, but that is the model that was in the previous legislation. Was that CBD would be would be under that new authority? And so that, that might fundamentally change extraction regulations, uh, cannabinoid testing. Could it, could it potentially raise the level of allowable THC and In order for it to be industrial hemp, it has to be 0.3 or below THC. So I, I, I don't know what the legislation, if any, would look like. I don't know what that, if they would write something in the law that would address that. However, I will say that the federal level is 0.3, and we're going to be held to the federal standard to get our program approved. So um, that's the best I can give you on that. Sure. Well, with the federal standard, it says any piece of the plant has to test at 0.3 percent and just hearing with what we we're talking about anything that's above six percent is going to be uh, in getting closer to that hot value so is there a way to how, how do we navigate that going forward again anticipating a, just taking the flower off if you take just isolating the flower like most stuff out there is hot but if you blend it all together as biomass then it's not going to be hot uh, we have a sampling protocol for the top 10 centimeters of the plant, that's, yeah. and that's that's yeah. the one that we're sticking. We we're trying to be consistent with what other states do as well, so that there wouldn't be any situation where um, New York state products might have some taint to them if, with regard to interstate transportation if we weren't held to the same standard as other people. So, So the, 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 question, the question is with regard to some marijuana plants that are showing up in fields that are planted to some other crop? Or to hemp. Now, or to hemp. So it, it does. So basically saying, what's the possibility of having unlicensed growers? Is that what you're asking? No, I, I think you're wondering, are you wondering about... There's no regulation that would, would address that. I, are you worried about if, if your field tested hot because of that crop? Or, or I would. Doing those now right. So I would hope that the randomness of our sampling protocol would take that worry away. Um, if that wasn't the case, and if it was a special circumstance that you could prove that you there was some renegade crop growing there. We, we could probably take a look at that, have our inspectors come back out and see exactly what's going on there. Until it falls into law enforcement's hands, right, yeah. Right. So, one last question for me. Okay, uh, I'll allow it. Do you, <laughs> do you, do you, will you have a published procedure for how you will handle a non-compliant test? And what will be the steps that you or law enforcement will take after that non-compliant test? Will there be a second test? Will law enforcement be brought to the field? What, what's going to happen? Larry always has to do this to me. He asks me a question I don't know the answer to. That procedure, that policy has not yet been established, but I, we are going to have to come up with a destruction policy. It is not our intention to be law enforcement or take the place of law enforcement's uh, jurisdiction. If somebody in our program ends up with a field that's hot, we, we will work with them to destroy the crop and, and we will not, our first call is not going to be to law enforcement to get them jammed up uh, in a legal proceeding. We, we, want, we want this program to succeed and we want our, our program participants to, to succeed. So we'll do everything we can within, within the law and um, you know, we have to keep in mind that we're going to have the federal government looking at us to make sure that we're doing everything we need to do to stay compliant with, with their requirements. So. Okay. Thanks a lot, Tim. Okay. this if you guys want to follow along. Um, it's, it's a little bit different than some of the other hemp handouts because the entire first page is about the weather. Um, 
So um, I'm sure there's a lot of growers from different, not just hemp, in the group. And um, we've had a couple rough years, the last two. Um, 2017 was the first time we got an actual spring planting of hemp. And um, it was wet. It was a wet spring. We planted late. In some of our locations, we had lots of pythium, so we lost a lot of seedlings to that. Um, and then it sort of turned into like this beautiful summer. So all of our seedlings that survived the pythium grew beautifully. We had amazing yields. Um, I've looked at other uh, trials from around the country, and it was just like, yeah, we can we can definitely grow hemp for grain and fiber in New York. We we can do this. Um, and then we had a beautiful, long, dry, warm fall. So everything got harvested. Um, it, was, it was nice. It was really nice. Our highest yielding cultivar for grain was over a ton per acre. Very sorry. sorry. There's a bunch of people that are wanting to follow along but didn't have the handouts. Oh, sorry. So, <laughs> my bad. Slack it off. And then our grain, or our fiber yields were also really high. So we were had um, six and a half dry tons per acre was mm. our, our biomass produced, and that was in 72 days. So that's, that's enormous. Um, and then we had last year. Um, <laughs> so again, again, we had a pretty wet spring, so we planted a little bit later than we had hoped. Um, and then finally things dried out enough to plant and it was like someone could turn the faucet off. Like we had five to six weeks of just drought. Um, so we had pretty poor seedling stands and then in addition to that because of the drought we had a lot like stunting. The plants were just stunted. It was, we were watching it, you know, watching it like, you can do it plants. We're little cheerleaders. and. Um, and we thought we might be okay because the wheat, it was dry enough that the weeds weren't growing either. And then the rain started coming, like everyone prayed way too hard for rain last summer. That, I think that was the key because once it started, it didn't stop until the spring. And, and the weeds just took off and the weeds outgrew all of our shorter varieties. And, um, and then like I said, it, didn't it just didn't stop raining and <laughs> and so we had some big disease pressure later on in the season um, our grain yields were half that of what they were the year before the fiber yields weren't impacted nearly as much but um, but they were still four and a half tons versus six and a half tons four and a half tons is still a lot of forage to or, a biomass to produce in 75 days, but um, but it, you know it just still wasn't because this, the stands weren't as good to start out with, wasn't as good as in the year before, and then our grains yields were less, are about half as much. So there's a nice graph on the back. So we're, for this data, we had 13 grain varieties in 2017, but we and then four fiber types. We also had the four fiber types in 2018, but we added to it, so we ended up having um, closer to 25 grain and dual purpose types. But I didn't include that information in here because I just wanted to compare, you know, the same varieties in both years. Um, but I think the big difference that we saw in the grain that we harvested was the fusarium on the grain. I'm not going to talk about that too much because Gary will be up here in a little bit. But um, so there was a detectable vomitoxin in some of our trials. So especially trials that were in locations around um, areas where a lot of other wheat and barley and oats are produced. Those ones had very high levels. We had our highest detectable level of vomitoxin was 36.6 .6 parts per million on some of our hemp. So that's that's a lot, right? I think the cutoff for food is one to two per, 
two parts per million depending on what the main use is going to be. And so, I don't know, looking at this grain and seeing 36.6 parts per million was a shock for sure. Um, the other, other quality components of the grain were different as well. So in 2017, it was close to 36 um, percent oil in the seeds, and it was less, it was around 29 percent in 2018, so there was a big drop there as well. Um, and just, you could, you could look at the grain and see it was not of the right quality. It was weathered looking, there was lots more broken pieces, you could see discoloration from the disease um, all around. So in my head, in my head we had one awesome year, which can show the potential, like New York can do this, we've got the potential, the seed, um, the seed sources are there. And then the next year it was just like, whoa, we're gonna need some more tools and if, if we're gonna be able to manage this and really keep this going as a crop. Questions? Questions? <laughs> yes. Yeah. All of our all of our certified lots, seed lots, were fine for THC. Nothing came even close to the 0.3% limit. Yeah. Yes. Um, to, um, he was asking if the, the fusarium was a blew in from the neighboring fields, and that is very likely the chance. Last year was a really bad year for fusarium on all of this small grains and corn and hemp. It was all over just a really bad year for fusarium. Okay. Thank you, Jamie. Craig Carlson, just going to give a quick update on our uh, breeding program here. Yeah, so these cultivar trials are um, really good at informing New York farmers, uh, but they also inform breeders like me. Um, our breeding program is prim primarily focused on developing disease-resistant, high-yielding varieties with decent you know, oil and protein content. Uh, and diverse cannabinoid profiles. Uh, so we make selections from some of these cultivars that we've tested in the field. So we've been doing this for the past like three years. Um, this year we identified a subset of uh, high yielding dual purpose cultivars that have good grain yield uh, along with good uh, cannab cannab cannabinoid profiles. Um, so what we did is uh, we um, uh, took seed lots uh, from these particular varieties uh, and grew them out in seed flats and uh, we made early selections at the seedling stage based on plant you know, seedling vigor or height, um, you know, lack of disease. Uh, and then from there we're using high throughput molecular markers to first uh, identify a cannabinoid type or hemp type or, mar or uh, marijuana type, uh, so we can um, create progeny uh, that are homozygous hemp types. So we want to make uh, we want to make hemp populations. We don't want to make hemp marijuana populations. We saw that a lot of these uh, cultivars uh, from the last couple of years have been segregating for uh, hemp and marijuana type. Uh, so, if you want to talk to Jacob, he's uh, in our lab. Uh, he talked a little bit about that earlier. If you want to talk to uh, uh, me about that more, or Jacob more, just come up and ask us. Um, but, so, what we do is we're, we're screening these plants for uh, cannabinoid type, and then what we want to do is select from that subset uh, a percentage of females and a percentage of males that are hemp type and then we'll bring in hemp type females into greenhouse ranges, you know, different varieties of these uh, hemp females and introduce them into a, 
uh, introduced them to a single uh, male cultivar that we've also screened. And from, from there, we bulk those seeds and we'll, uh, you know, we'll bulk those seeds, clean it, and plant it out in the field. Um, this year we planted out, uh, I think, 10 crosses. Um, and we're still working on some more in the greenhouse. Uh, we've also done some feminized populations that we're doing selections on. Um, so from there we'll make selections in the field. Uh, so we don't. So we'll make selections in the field, bring them into the greenhouse, and use those for our future crosses. So the big, you know, we, so we don't have to really uh, rely on isolation. You know, so we don't have to fear pollen in the field. Uh, we're actually wanting to go out, do some cultivar evaluations in the field, all in one big field, instead of isolated blocks. You know, three miles apart from one another. It's just we just don't have the uh, tools to do that right now. Uh, so we've also uh, we've also uh, evaluated different feral populations from Wisconsin, Illinois, um, Nebraska, and some New York feral populations, as well as different um, feminized populations and dioecious populations of varying pedigrees. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what kind of traits we we can uh, garner from those populations. So again, like Larry said, we're doing genotyping just to look at the genetic diversity of the plants that New York farmers are uh, planting around the state. Uh, we've uh, done this for a year. We have, well, we have two plates of GBS, or it's genotyping by sequencing. Uh, it's, a different, it's our genotyping method. Uh, but we're going to submit another plate soon. So if you're interested in getting your plants that you're growing uh, genotyped, it won't be a, there won't be any cost to you. We just will visit your field, collect your sample from your plant, and then we'll share it with you. You know, we want to be as open as possible in our breeding program, in our genotyping program, and we'll offer that, you know, we'll throw that up online uh, so you can see where your plants sit uh, in the entire, you know, uh, what was that? The galaxy of your of, of our genetic diversity that we see here. So, thank you. One quick question. But yeah, just come up and talk to me if you want to do that. I've I've got a sign up sheet, and if you know your cultivars offhand, you can just write those down. Thank you. So let me just give uh, just a two second summary of what we've learned so far, and we haven't gotten our second set of ninety five samples back. Uh, not every variety is named according to its uh, genetic makeup. <laughs> uh, so sometimes names don't match genetics, uh, and that can be interesting. And also that we do see groupings of different uh, cultivars into distinct genetic groups. Uh, so we would like to expand that analysis uh, with another 95 samples. So if you're interested in doing that, please let us know. Thanks very much, Craig. So, so certainly with a new crop on the landscape, uh, the risk of diseases is eminent. And uh, we're very fortunate to have Gary Bergstrom here to talk about uh, the surveys and the characterizations they've done of hemp diseases so far. Yep. Hello, everybody. So I'd like to start out by acknowledging two people in my lab that are really at the, at the forefront of our diagnostic effort, uh, Jen Starr, Kevin Myers, would you stand up there? And, and uh, all three of us will be around and uh, would love to visit with you about things uh, that you think may be diseases that you're seeing in your fields. Uh, but we're, uh, I think we will all agree we're still learning a lot. And, uh, it, this is the third year of our effort to try to, in surveillance, to try to find out what's going on in, uh, uh, in commercial fields of hemp, as well as in some of the kind of variety trials that you've seen here today. And if you noticed, it was by and large pretty clean. We found that little bit of powdery mildew. We did collect a few very minor leaf spots, and you may have uh, noticed a, a few plants showing willowing, uh, wilting on one side of the plant. I think there's some fusarium wilt in, in a relatively few plants out there. Um, but uh, with certainty, as we intensify production of this crop, like any other crop we grow, 
if, if we, uh, you know, have it, have it grown in more fields and have it grown more intensively with greater frequency and not in any particular field, uh, we're likely to see uh, eventually uh, an increase in some of our disease problems. So at the, uh, at the onset here, we're trying to record everything, even some insignificant little spot on a leaf. We're trying to find out what, uh, what organism uh, causes it, uh, you know, uh, is there super susceptibility in some of our varieties, etc. So we're trying to get a handle on all of that. And uh, we're very interested in uh, collaborating with all of you, a lot more eyes and ears uh, here. We, we certainly aren't getting to the vast majority of your, of your field. So keep us in mind, either through your uh, cooperative extension uh, uh, educator in your local area, and, and a number of them are here with us today, or uh, contact me or, or those in my lab. We'd be very interested in that. So uh, at this point, where are we? We're, we're basically want to minimize uh, diseases as, as a factor in the production of this crop. And since you've already heard a couple of times, we don't have uh, registered, legal, available, and efficacious uh, fungicides as one of the tools at this point. I think this will change over time. Uh, but we have very good agronomic practices that we can put in place. We can, uh, for starters, uh, put a lot of emphasis on, uh, on, on site selection. You've heard that uh, the, the sites on your farm where you're going to grow the crop, we, we need a well-drained site, okay? Pythium's going to be a problem, and uh, it's not going to be adapted to every field on your farm. Um, we also know right off the bat that, we, that this is a crop that is very susceptible uh, to white mold uh, fungus, the uh, sclerotinia fungus, which is a very wide host range fungus. And this is already a principal problem for us in this state in growing crops like dry beans, snap beans, soybeans, uh, a number of other vegetable crops. So we know that if we have white mold problem in those other crops, it's only going to lead to uh, a white mold problem uh, in the hemp if we uh, follow those in rotation. So being aware of not only the hemp and the hemp varieties, but what is the previous cropping history in the field is very important. Um, you're going to hear in a little bit here uh, from Dr. Alan Taylor, uh, who's going to talk about some of the uh, pioneering work on looking at efficacy of different uh, synthetic chemicals and uh, biological uh, materials uh, for application to seed to, to try to uh, uh, get some control of some of these seed-borne and early growth so soil-borne microorganisms. So I won't say a lot about that other than to say that that is a critical issue. And probably where we need pesticides the most is, is getting that seed out of the ground, getting a vigorous initial stand. So hopefully that'll be one of the first uh, developments in, in that arena. Um, and a good seed bed is important as well, to, to really prepare the ground well. Um, I don't know how much uh, anybody is planting in a no-till situation right now. That has some, probably not too much, and that's probably just as well because that, that has some other complications as well as far as uh, seed emergence. And depending on what the crop residue from the previous crop, we could be carrying along pathogens from a previous crop. Um, so my biggest concerns are at the two ends of the growing season, getting that seedling out of the ground, uh, getting it protected that way. And I'm also, in our program, we're putting a lot of current emphasis on the end of the season kind of problems uh, of diseases and also mycotoxins. Uh, one of the things that's nearly universal that I've seen in looking at fields is Botrytis gray mold. And it has that gray webby growth all over the, 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 uh, the floral parts and whatnot. And that's, that's gonna be problematic for any end use. Uh, uh, you know, kind of an anti-quality factor there. Um, so we're, we're aware of that. I, there, there may or may not turn out to be some varietal differences along that line, hopefully, that we could see something like that. But uh, also, uh, I know uh, Chris's uh, group is, is doing some work with some of the same chemicals. She's looking against powdery mildew, interesting in, interested in finding something that might have efficacy against botrytis as well. I'm concentrating very much on, on the fungi that uh, will colonize the finished product, either the, the grain, the seed, uh, or those buds. And what we find is a predominance of fusarium fungi. And uh, fusarium is uh, notorious for producing mycotoxins. 
And I've spent the better part of my career working in cereal crops where the principal problem has been fusarium head blight and contamination of the, of the grain with uh, deoxynovalanol, also known as vomitoxin. And so it was at least a mild surprise to me to start looking at quality in the, uh, in the hemp and finding that th those same problems are very prevalent there. And we're finding uh, a diversity of fusarium species, uh, particularly fusarium graminiarum, which is the principal problem we have on, on corn and small grain cereals, um, which does in the long term open up the whole uh, crop rotation question a little bit as well, because the, the, the wisdom would be if we're having problems with white mold and we have some commonality with maybe some of our uh, diseases of vegetables in some cases, that grain crops would be a great rotation. Well, there's a caveat on that. We have to look at that, and I think that we have to be conscious of how fusarium might be building up in the, in the grain crop that uh, precedes uh, the hemp crop. So we have a lot to learn about that. Uh, again, we may, you know, get super lucky and find, uh, find a variety or some genes in particular that would confer resistance to fusarium, but I wouldn't hold out a lot of hope on that. I've been working in cereal systems for uh, on my fourth decade now, and it is still an elusive problem genetically. We have been able to basically sort out the super susceptible varieties and kind of push them to the side. And we have found uh, genetic control that moderates a, a, you know, kind of intermediate level of resistance. And yet, when it rains, when the crops flower, and we have the fungus in the air, we will get fusarium develop, and we will have mycotoxins. Uh, Jamie uh, maybe scared you a little bit about that one figure, about 36 parts per million, and that I'm hoping is an extreme case, but uh, we've been looking at seed lots from the last couple of years, and it's not unusual to, ha to have four, five, six parts per million. Uh, the FDA guidelines for any human food product is one part per million. Okay, so there, there will be some effort made to try to bring things down to that. Um, one of the things that we're actively looking at in our research program uh, is uh, we're looking at the possibility of both um, organically approved type uh, fungicide materials, biofungicides, as well as more traditional uh, chemical fungicides, and we're applying that at, at the outset of flowering on the crop. Uh, we have some experiment, we're doing some timings on that too. So we would like to see uh, what potential that has in bringing down, suppressing uh, the levels of this deoxynovalanol toxin in the, in the grain or in the, in the buds. So that's something we feel is pretty high priority right now. Um, talking about kind of in the middle of the growing season, we've seen an awful a lot of different things. We've seen some of these vascular wilt disorders haven't seen a complete wipeout of many fields of that, but we've seen some serious problems in a couple of cases with, with pythium root rot that, st uh, that starts early in the season and progresses into killing whole plants. Also, the fusarium fungus in soils can do that. You may have seen some stray plants in the plots this morning that showed uh, fusarium wilt. Uh, what we have seen is a whole uh, uh, diversity of fungal leaf spots, and some of them really very minor. Uh, you know, have to look a long way in a row and find a couple spots here and there. And a couple of diseases, in particular one we call bipolaris uh, leaf spot, uh, that seems some connection with varieties as well, um, but it can be severe blighting of the whole canopy. So uh, we will be looking primarily at genetic varietal selection uh, in the future as a means of combating some of those things. And uh, so we look forward to, to working together with Larry's program and, and others here to try to get a better handle on those things. But there's, uh, if you're into Latin names, there's a few on that sheet there. They're all kinds of genera of fungi that we have found uh, associated with these blights. And uh, we're methodically working through proving their pathogenicity, isolating them in pure culture, inoculating them onto different varieties of, uh, of hemp in the greenhouse and seeing to what extent they are pathogenic. Another interesting question is the host range of some of these pathogenic microbes. Uh, for instance, we, we found some organisms uh, that we haven't proven yet, but very similar organism found on the weeds nearby in our hemp plots. So it could be that weed control is also important in, uh, you know, in the epidemiology of some of these diseases. So we, we have a tremendous amount to learn. 
and uh, we look forward to uh, you being students along with us and, and help us uh, to learn some of these things. So um, are there some questions or some observations you'd like to share? Okay, the question was whether we have found any difference in susceptibility, if you will, between the monoecious and dioecious varieties. Um, since we're basically just looking, at, we're not inoculating anything, so there's no controlled experiments to do that comparison, so we can't definitively describe that. Uh, the vast majority of the varieties in field settings we've seen before, uh, so far, disease is fairly uncommon. Most, most of the plants of all, all types are looking fair, well, I won't say resistant because they may not have been exposed to the inoculum. But uh, I don't have any general observation on that line. Uh, is there some information anybody's aware of along that line? Yeah, we've been going in for quite a few years. Good. Yep. I appreciate that observation, and we can we can try to look at that a little more closely. That's that's very helpful. Thank you, thank you. <coughs> so I'm just curious if anybody that's been growing the crop has had any significant production issue with disease. They don't want to be the only one. So okay, <laughs> come talk to me uh, privately. Thank you. And uh, our last speaker of the afternoon is Dr. Alan Taylor, who is a seed scientist here at Cornell Agritech and has been doing some research on seed treatments uh, and their interaction with soil pathogens. Alan. Thanks, Larry. And, uh, you can see quite a, a number of speakers that we have today, uh, but really I, I want to say as, as a seed guy, to be a part of the Cornell hemp team has been really rewarding with this project. Pathologists, plant breeders, a cadre of people and their expertises uh, that Chris and Larry have really pooled together their expertises so we can move together. So, so that's been really rewarding. So my program in the area of seed science and technology, uh, besides what I'm going to be talking to you on the seed treatment project today, is we also try to provide support to the other ongoing projects. So, when we're looking at some of the seed lots that are coming in, we'll do the germination, purity, to seed quality. So we're, we're doing that in conjunction with the, with the larger project to kind of move everything forward so we all kind of learn together. Um, Tim talked about in his presentation from Ag and Markets about the big picture going on with, with the farm bill. And really, if I go back a year ago, when we started working with the seed treatments to really pitch this, to this IR4 group, which is the national group, which fosters registration for specialty crops. I kind of got hemp is considered as a specialty crop, but that they would be working on biological and chemical seed treatments. And at that time, just a year ago at this time, before the 2018 Farm Bill was passed, uh, it was all the industrial hemp, CBD hemp was lumped in with the recreational cannabis, so there's no pesticides were labeled on this. So this is really a, a void. However, there's already very mature materials, especially the chemical seed treatments that are already there and you use this if you grow any other crops or even biological. So, so really our project was kind of to pull some of this together, some of these promising materials that have already been used commercially on other crops to see how they're going to work on, on hemp. Uh, I want to thank uh, Gary who just talked about First of all, the need, really of need, of getting this crop, a direct seeded crop for an industrial, for either fiber or for grain, to get it established in the seed treatments and how that can help that. Also, Gary's group have been very supportive in providing the pathology support for this project as well. So it's fortunate, again, getting back to this IR4 group, uh, again, that they, their whole purpose is to foster registration. We have what's called their integrated solutions, which is one of their large programs, which become a multi-regional. So we have field studies we'll be talking about from Cornell at two locations. We also have field studies at, in the southern region at Virginia Tech, and then uh, also at North Dakota State in the south central, excuse me, the north central region there. So when we did this, we've, uh, 
use one variety of Anka as a dual purpose variety, and Anka has been kind of our white rat that we do for a lot of our seed quality investigations. Uh, good quality seed lot to begin with. We've developed my laboratory, if, if I'm kind of working off of this handout, if you have it, the evaluation of seed treatments on industrial crops for management of, of damping off. So we have a laboratory scale seed treatment equipment. My program is pretty unique in the, in the United States for having small scale equipment that we can basically simulate what a larger seed company would be doing on treating many, many pounds of seeds. We can treat just uh, an ounce of seed, which is fine for most of our, our trials. So we're able to do that in-house. We do a lot of screening on, on what seed treatment binders, so some of the particulars that I'm not going to go into here. But the first thing we want to do is we're amassing these materials. We're looking at biologicals. Biologicals are two major uh, biocontrol agents. It's either a beneficial fungi, the trichoderma, or a beneficial bacteria, which are bacillus. And then we also had uh, chemicals. Uh, Syngenta is the only chemical company that stepped up a year ago. So very mature materials, the Apron XL Maxim materials uh, that are widely registered on, on uh, vegetable as well as field crops. We also have biochemical materials. In the chemical group are called phosphites. You know phosphate as a fertilizer. But the phosphites are unique that they're systemic materials, but also have been shown in other systems to control pythium. So we wanted to include that. Uh, number of pathogens, uh, pythium, uh, just like, uh, again, Gary kind of set the stage for me to talk about this. The pythium has kind of been our, our key target pathogen, but also fusarium and rhizoctonia that can be there. We have a laboratory bioassay that we screened materials early on just to look at application rates. Also, if there's any potential phytotoxicity as we're applying materials, again, for the first time on hemp, we don't know what that uh, seed treatment uh, crop combination is going to yield. So we did all that type of background information. Uh, if you're interested in the data, it's on the back sheet. And to try to simplify, because there's, there's 15 treatments, and rather than to try to go through all this, I color-coded this to really kind of simplify. And uh, you can, if you don't have it, you can almost see it from here, is on the, the stand improves here. And then we see all these treatments in blue are the chemical seed treatments. That's the Apron XL Maxim combination doing very well. And you would expect that. They're very well, well developed chemistries for control. The two black treatments are the non-treated seeds. So that's our check. And then all these greens are the biological. So the biologicals in, in our hands on hemp is affording really no appreciable protection against early season damping off. This is just based on our two field studies. We had the, the field study conducted in East Ithaca, and I want to thank Jamie, uh, who just talked to you a few minutes ago, helping coordinate that site, and then the Geneva site uh, that Larry's group uh, was very supportive in helping us getting that one launched as well. So we're really at the first year with this. At this point in time, I'm still waiting for the data from the Virginia Tech sites and the North Dakota so we can start filling this in. And again, that's really the purpose of having a multi-state, multi-region project is in case we have flukes in our data, we want to see what sort of a consistent trends there would be over the long run. Uh, we're in communication now with all the companies, four biological companies, the chemical company, things like that. So they are too abreast of this. We're going to be, our plans right now would be to continue this project for the second year. We'll be tweaking some things, going back to kind of the drawing board and looking at especially these biologicals, try to improve their efficacy to get them to improve, improve better, especially using pythium as our target pathogen. So that's kind of a very quickly in a nutshell uh, kind of what we found. If there's any questions on this or other seed questions? What yes. were the three? You said pythium, uh, so, fusarium, so pythium, and fusarium, and rhizoctonia are kind of the three Rhizoctone. key that the pathogen, three key soil-borne pathogens that would be attacking the seed. Yeah. Okay. And again, when we focus this, when we had the naturally infested soil with pythium, Gary's group did the characterization of that pythium for us, so we know what pathogen, what what species that we're dealing with. And so with, a, with our tell, roll tell test, which is kind of a seed testing procedure, then we can screen things, you know, 24-7. And so we can see kind of what's going on, which treatments are doing well, which ones are not doing well in that. Yeah, thanks. Good question.
Okay, I'll turn this back over to Larry so we can get on field. Thank you, Alan. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.